at the very beginning of the project. So it was 2009 when I was there. And I was only for two months. So I think my experience is just a glance of the very beginning. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I can tell you about it. And it's, it's definitely also interesting to me to see what are the things that are not mentioned when they talk about this project. Because this project has been talked and reviewed mainly from the art world, mm -hmm. which is good, I guess, to bring up these kind of discussions. But they keep on reviewing it and analyzing it as a piece of, as a work of art, as a, a work that has an author. And it is, it does. I mean, Fiesta is behind it. But there's the, the main thing of, of Dorchester is that it's a house that brings people and that is grown because of the collaborations. And if it's become so alive, it's because all the people that is around the project. And I don't think Fiesta is the one that denies it or forgets about them. I think it's the way people have reviewed the project. Right, interesting that people sometimes just want to connect with the notion of the author. And yeah, this, exactly. This is great because this is what Tanya talks about all the time, that we are people in the 21st century dealing with a much more complex scenario in terms of how art works, I mean art functions, <laughs> mm -hmm. and how, how the art world works, and but also how creativity works, and and the idea of the artist as the author of something that sort of begins and stops with them is maybe different. And one of the suggestions around Art Util is the idea that maybe there's an initiator and then there are users or there are people who take it over, actually. Or uh, yeah, and, and I think it's very organic in a way how the Dorchester, the Dorchester project has uh, worked because... Yeah, I mean, he you can name him as an initiator or manager, author, however you want to name him. But he definitely is honest about like, One of the main differences is that, first of all, he lives there. Yeah. We were not living there. We were just... Uh, Transient, in a way. Yeah. But he owns that house. And he decided, like, he knew he wanted to make it happen. But uh, when he invited me, he, he just had this um, kind of naive but also ambitious idea of having this beautiful... Uh, dinners and just invite everyone and try to start to explore what could happen there. And, and who's everyone? Who's everyone? Mm -hmm. Who is well, everyone? Just friends. And I think when he told me about this idea, he thought to bring the people living in the area. Then right. he, they were poor. He, there, were, there were a lot of conflicts in the area. So he told me about that and I thought that's, yeah, that is actually possible. And I remember we were in this dinner with the black monks and they live in Chicago and they were looking at me and they were looking at me and said, like, what are you talking about? Like, you're a bit crazy to do, <laughs> to think about this. But I thought, no, that actually sounds really good and I would be very happy if I ever had the chance to do that. But I had other plans back then. But so I was in New York and I was uh, planning to do a, to take a job that couldn't happen because I had other uh, schedule later on. So I called him and I said, hey, do you, are you serious about your proposal? Are you, are you really doing this? And do you really want me to come over and help you? And he was very serious. So it sounds a bit naive and crazy, the project, but he was very serious. And he just met people and believed in them and would bring them over or would show this idea to other people and kind of grew from that, so in, in that sense, I, I say it's organic and it's honest because he was very honest about it. He wasn't pretending, I, or maybe he was pretending at some point, like uh, pretending that we could believe in this, but pretending because he actually wanted it to happen. In this show, we actually have t three rooms of kind of analysis. There are rooms that where we try and take a step back from r 2 teal and look at why we might be showing all this stuff. And one room is um, the room of controversies. And another room is the room of um, propaganda, legitimation, and belief. 
Mm-hmm. And belief is a really important one. Uh, Shanna Van Huysweg, many other artists talk about the idea that, you know, if you didn't have this sense of kind of whether it's naive, uh, mm-hmm. but it's a belief in, in, yeah. in the idea that it could be other. And yeah, of course, exactly. everybody knows how things are and everybody mm-hmm. knows both legally, governmentally. And I suppose one of the interesting ideas to explore around r 2 Teal is the idea that the creativity that we normally associate with producing perhaps an art object or an art project is actually in, it sort of in now implicit in the idea of realizing something in society otherwise. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I guess, yeah, he, he believed in this, but also he was not alone believing this. So I believe sure. this could happen. And there was a, lo- a, a good... He had a really nice uh, network of friends. Because the other thing that nobody realizes is that Fiester is not doing this project like somewhere else. You know, he's doing it in his hometown. And they, they forget all the time about the context where this project is taking place. And it's Chicago where like this project is very rooted or it's in, to be rooted in. The, the project is rooted in one neighborhood, but if you've been to Chicago, you know that each neighborhood is very strong and it's also very particular and they, they have very strong ethnic and economic borders. At the same time, it's, it's, Chicago has this tradition in art where artists get really strongly involved sometimes with their communities. It's just, to me, it's kind of interesting to see that they forget about this when they review his project. Anyway, but Fiesta has been working in Chicago for a long time and you can, yeah, you can bring up and review this as an art project, but he's also an urban planner and he's been in Chicago involved in any, in many other uh, projects. Like when I was there with the Black Moss, they were um, uh, playing for uh, funding, uh, right. racing, and there's the Black Monks, but there's also, he was uh, involved with the Little Black Pearl, which was a youth organization that worked creatively with uh, with youth. Mm-hmm. Also in the south side of Chicago, he works in the, in the University of Chicago, and then he has this amazing network of friends who are also very active uh, artists and just community builders, and so... When I was there, we were working together on, yeah, uh, making these dinners happen and some meetings and also uh, on the house that he had bought next door. Mm -hmm. And there were a lot of people that helped him to do so. For example, Erika Dudley, she's she's also a chick Howan. And she knows so much about about food and about the uh, the lack of food in the neighborhood where uh, the house is. And you she's mean worked in terms a lot of better. nutrition and stuff. Yeah, right. like just the lack of uh, uh, stores where you can get uh, fresh food. Like there's a wow. lot of uh, yeah. prepared and fast food places, but there's the, this area is called a uh, food desert because there's no food available. And yeah, literally, I I wanted to get some food uh, for the dinners and I went to different stores. And first of all, I was too naive when I went because uh, there was no, there was almost nothing in those stores. And um, it's easier to get drugs. So yeah, so Erica Dudley has uh, in-depth and first-hand knowledge of all these kind of issues. And she's worked also with youth and with the social issues. and, And also she's a great chef. And she's been to Japan, and she knows a lot of soul food and a lot of Japanese food. So she helped a lot, and is still very involved in the dinners nice. and creating these dinners and making it happen. And then, um, yeah, other uh, collaborators like uh, Leanne Norman, who also was very active uh, exploring what is art and community, mm-hmm. and well also Dara Epison who was also helping him a lot and she had been working at Little Black Pearl and in other organizations and then just friends of Fiesta like in 
that are working in their own neighborhoods, like uh, Maria Gaspar, who's an artist and very involved with the community, the Mexican community around Little Village. Was the art part? I think it just gave room. It just gave room to bring all these uh, possibilities in in this side. Right. And it wouldn't have happened if there was not this energy, if there was no this pusher behind it, and also if he didn't share the belief with other people that would believe it. That they would believe in him because he has the energy to carry it on, yeah. but also to bring other people to to make it happen. Mm-hmm. And in that sense, it just yeah, it could happen. And in a way, it's different than simply just gentrification. I'm not saying that gentrification may not happen in the long term. Sure, but it's in order for the whole neighborhood to change and gentrify. It needs to happen much more. And when I was living there, it's such a tough neighborhood. And people had just, I was very naive, as I said, to get there. And that was good because I didn't know how the neighborhood was. And also because I lived in it, I wasn't uh, uh, shy about it. But it was a tough neighborhood. Like, there were was on the street, and there, were, there was the police, there were just in the house next door and things like that and mm-hmm. it was it was tough but at the same time it's a it's in a really beautiful neighborhood and it's really close to the lake and it's yeah it could it would be sad if it gets gentrified because it's such a beautiful location and I think the people that live there have the right to live there so it's good that he's taking on and kind of bolding the question about gentrification. And I think there's an awareness of that, like, um, because it has happened there before, that area was first a working a working class area, mm-hmm. and mainly Irish and, like, other people were living there, and then there was a... They moved when the African-Americans arrived, right. and so it's been this... Process this process goes on, yeah. yeah, yeah, And yeah. very close to this neighborhood, there's Pilsen, which was not so long ago, maybe 20 years ago, a very rough Mexican uh, neighborhood. Right. And if you go right now, it's full of uh, artists' work spaces and students living there, and, and the gentrification has, has been begun. really strong. Right. Partly, I think, because the Mexicans, we always bring food. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. And, Could be. Uh, and like <laughs> where I was living, that there's a food desert. Uh, right. Pilsen became just vibrant with murals different food, and activities. Different possibilities. Right. Interesting, isn't it? Yeah. 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 And in this case, I think he's making the effort to make this happen. 